from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Well, greetings everyone and welcome to uh, this week's edition of the Wow Report where we count down the top 10 things that make you go wow. wow. That's right. Um, we're still in lockdown, we're still in our homes, but we're very excited because this week we're joined by Jeffrey Boyer Chapman. Hi. Hi, Jeffrey. I'm, hi, Fenton. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. We Jeffrey, are so excited. This, we've done this with you twice before, or is it the first time? The second this time? Is, this is my second time. You, okay. Well, I, I think we're, you're almost a permanent guest host at this point. Almost. <laughs> Both times, conveniently, Randy wasn't here. Or or was Tom? Was Tom there last time? I feel like they're avoiding me. <laughs> Tom was there last time. Um, was he? Well, it's amazing that you've agreed to come back, because most guests are like, once is not. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. All right, so let's get started with the countdown. You're going to be with us and, until we reveal our number one, Jeffrey, but chime in at any time. Um, what's number 10? Number 10. Well, have you guys heard about the Rona rave in New York City? Yeah. This is, it, it's so incendiary and it's so upsetting that I think we need to just say that what happened was a bunch of A gays got together on Monday night and had a party and they partied in, in a loft and the party started. Uh, I, I started noticing on my Instagram feed around midnight that it was this thumping. There was a live DJ there. Everybody was in their thongs doing GHB poppers, doing K, doing meth. It was going. Cr everyone was. It, it was like it was like a huge party in this down in this in this loft. And when I went to bed at about three o'clock in the morning, it was still going on. So that was six a.m. on the on the East Coast. When I woke up, it was eleven a.m. and it was still going crazy. And I noticed at that point that gay Twitter was people were getting furious about it, saying, what the fuck are you guys doing? And it was hundreds and hundreds of people, and they all started going private. They All their Instagrams immediately went locked down, and they all turned it to private because they saw the, the, the blowback that they were getting. Am I getting that right a little bit, Blake? Yeah, that's all. That's what I heard. You were the one that actually brought this to my attention, but then I have like have been seeing it all over uh, gay Twitter, I guess, but apparently there were people that live with first lot frontline workers there. Yes, there, there were some. There were some EMT workers that were in the party in their jock straps, carrying on. There was a pharmacist, a, a well-known gay pharmacist, A-list gay pharmacist, who was there providing the GHB and the Xanax and everything like that. There was there. There were all sorts of. I mean, really, really top level. Instagram stars that were there just partying Gang like stars. it was 1996. But here, if it was on Instagram, and if you know about it, James, on the West Coast, how can this be private? Like, why can't no, 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 no. It, it was all of a sudden, I just started seeing on my Instagram and Twitter feed, people were outraged, showing pictures from it, say, saying, can you believe what the fuck is going on, blah, 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 blah. And then as... Everyone at the party started realizing that it was going viral around the world and everyone was was noticing that everybody at the party started turning their Instagrams in, uh, private. Jeffrey, did you know about this as it was happening? I've only just heard about it now, but more so than anything, I'm so curious to see who James follows on his Instagram and Twitter <laughs> that it would be blowing up his feed. Well, I, I mean, I happen to know a lot of party people. Let's just put that out there. And I happen to know. And, and so in my algorithm is such that I tend to find out what parties are happening where and what DJs are playing and what drag queens are performing and blah, blah, blah. So I start, it started all sort of dovetailing on my algorithm and people were calling it the Rona rave. They were calling it Tina and Rona's quarantine reunion. <laughs> I saw um, Risking Rona coming to Netflix soon, a reality show, Risking Rona. And then it was called The Meth Gala. <laughs> uh, oh, that's too real. Monday night, the first Monday. Yeah, the, the, yeah, it was the first Monday. And I just, you know, there's, there's something else that's also happening. There's someone else that 
I'm not going to mention any names again right here, but there is someone. No, but because it, because we're on a radio show, and this is it's somebody that we admire, somebody that we've looked up to for years and years and years, somebody that we love, 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 and they are not taking the quarantine seriously. And I've been seeing that they've been having parties every single night, fifty, a hundred people coming to their loft every night. And um, it was in page six recently that they were out partying with with some other celebrities at someone else's loft. And it, it's infuriating that that these people, I understand partying. I understand all of that and the need to do it. But <laughs> yes. now is not the time. I love the fact that you say you understand the need to party. No, I do, I do. it's a release, and it, it's something that, that a, a certain there's a certain mindset that, like, when the going gets tough, the, the the tough go partying, you know. And but now is not the time to be doing that, and it's it's very sad and it's upsetting that these people are risking not only their lives but the lives of the general population because they can't just stay home. They should be staying the fuck home, right? And yeah. subscribing to Wire Presents Plus, right, James? Yeah. <laughs> and watching you. And watching me. Yeah. That's a party. All right. Well, okay, let's let's go on to number nine. Um, I am gonna spend the rest of the show Googling, looking up who these A gays are. To, <laughs> you know? It's what I'm doing right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Blake, take it away. What's next? Uh, let's see. Number nine, James. Oh. Number nine. Well, we go from the Met Gala to the actual Met Gala, which was supposed to be this week. And, um, you know, it was it was canceled. And I'm saying, let's just let it go. I don't think we ever need to have it again. I am over that shit. I think it is tired. I think it is a, a relic of the past. I don't think we need it anymore. I'm going to do a brief history of the Met Gala very quickly because it started in the 1970s with Diana Vreeland, who what? was the That's Empress awesome. of Vogue in the 50s and 60s. She was Diana Winter of her time, very grand woman. And she started the Met Gala as a way to introduce the fashion industry to the media moguls and the society people. So it was like Jackie O and Babe Paley and William S. Paley and Andy Warhol. And it was very she-she and, and rah, rah, rah. And I remember in the 70s, early eight, maybe it was early 80s, that Cher went to it. And it was a society scandal because Cher was TV. She was television. Like, like we let Cher come to the Met Gala. It was like a huge deal. You know, it's her boobies were out. It was like, it was like, what? It was terrible. You know, so it was very chic. And then in the 1980s, after Diana Vreeland left, it went to Pat Buckley. And Pat, Pat Fenton, you remember Pat Buckley. She was the doyen of high society. She was she was like Brooke Astor. Like you could not get higher than Pat Buckley. And she made it even more, more high society and more in. And to get an invite to the Met Ball, you had to really be up there. It was like a really big deal. Well, then in the 90s, along comes Anna Wintour. And we know what happens whenever Anna, to whatever Anna touches, turns to, uh, okay, I'm just going to say it. She she opened the doors to every Kardashian, every reality star, every Instagram influencer, every one hit wonder, every rap star. It just became this whole like crush of every Katy Perry dressing up as a bottle of Purell every time. <laughs> you know, I'm mean, like, like, come on, kid. Like, this is not what it was. And it turned into this whole like B and B scene on the red carpet, and you had to have this outfit, a uh, uh, forty thousand dollar, fifty thousand dollar, hundred thousand dollar outfit to just get on the red carpet. And it turned, it got a little, it it it, it went a little like like um, uh, so, uh, let them eat cake, Marie Antoinette. It was it was getting a little too like like we've gone, it went too far over the top. And I'm saying it's gone, it's over. Pull it back. We don't need that kind of over the top stuff anymore. And I, I, I've never been, Jeffrey. Uh, I've never been to the Met Gala. Uh, I, I thought that part of the intention of the Met Gala was it was an annual fundraiser for the Fashion Institute of the Met. Is that yeah. not correct? Yes, it is. And it, 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 it's for, you know, the, the Metropolitan Museum and the costume exhibit are, are beyond reproach. I mean, they're fabulous, fabulous things. And the the and the and um, the charity aspect of it is fantastic. I'm saying that what happened with the celebrity aspect, mm -hmm. it tilted too far in one direction. And it's time to pull it back and turn it back into a charity, you know, fundraiser, philanthropic thing. 
I love I the fact that you're willing to shame Anna Wintour for the Met Ball, and you're not even willing to name the A gays behind the Met Ball. Well, I you know it is sort of open season on Anna right now it is, yeah. because of Andre Leon Talley's book. So I'm just I I'm not afraid of Anna anymore because I have a feeling that she's about to fall any second. So I, I, I I'm going on the I'm not I'm not scared to go out in public and say that Anna destroyed the Met Ball. Well, just you wait. She'll be back, and she won't invite you. Next she's never time. invited me, and that's the whole point. I was never invited, and so that's why I'm bitter and angry about the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, to you wear a bottle of your own, uh, my yeah. Kate Perry could just as good. <laughs> <laughs> I just I need them to go for one more year so we can get Rue there on the red carpet in full drag. Yeah, well, Rue has gone, and we all, you know, Violet has gone, Miss Fame has gone, Aquaria has gone. There have we've we've gotten some of our girls there, and I feel like like we made we we've gotten we made inroads. So I I think that, that it's it's fine that, that they've been there, and now they don't ever have to go again. I suppose my only thing is like if you go, I feel that you have to you should stay in the outfit you arrive in, and the idea that they just walk the red carpet and immediately change out of. Katy Perry ditches the chandelier and turns into a hamburger. I, I just did like a. Come I, on. It, it did. It it got too. It, it was too full of itself, and it turned into the Oscar red carpet, and it turned into just it. It was just it stopped being what it was supposed to be about, which was just about it, the fashion community being in finally getting you know to get out of its bubble and get to meet other people in other in other different mm -hmm. types of communities. All right, um, number eight. Number eight. James, this one's for you. I am reading the new uh, Warhol biography. It's just called Warhol. Actually, I think I had it. Yeah. This is the one that, that, I, that I, when I showed it to you, had you already gotten it? Did you know about it? Yes. Okay. It's, it's Warhol, and it's uh, 960 something pages. Um, I'm actually, um, it's by Blake Gottnick. I'm actually only. Um, I'm about 200 pages in. So, you know, the problem with biographies is they sort of always begin with the kid, you know, the grandparents, and it just gets, it takes a while for biographies to get to the good bits, right? But this is really, this is really fantastic. And it's just interesting learning about Warhol, more detail than most people I think would ever want Wait, to. Who, who is this author and how does he have the access? How, how, is it, how is it different than like Bob Coachello's book? Well, he's not. He's a scholar more than a than someone who was in Warhol Circle, and he's been working on it for years. I mean, it's just so densely detailed, and um, it's just really well written, James. I mean, in 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 the old days, you didn't have to be someone's friend to write their biography. You know, you just get to the library and do the research for a few years. I think one of my favorite parts of biographies is when they go into the inner workings and the details of who these people are, where they came from, starting with their grandparents. I think it's so powerful and humanizing for uh, people to see that there are some extraordinary public figures out there in the world that started out from very humble beginnings and there's not much of a difference between us and them and it serves as a form of inspiration for right. us to aspire to be as extraordinary as someone like Andy Warhol. Well weirdly I've actually been to the the, the town that Warhol's parents were from in somewhere behind the Iron Curtain I forget what, I can't, having been there, I can't even remember what it was called. Wait, were they, weren't they like, Polish? Were they, what were they? Were they? What were what? Well, where, what was the town? Where was the town? I can't remember the name of the town. Oh, what, what country was it from now? Just Czechoslovakia. Oh, like, Czech, okay, yeah. Um, um, look, it's gonna take me forever to find it. Um, but there was a sort of Russian gymnasium that had been turned into a Warhol museum and they had a pair of his glasses and things. and. Um, but it's really good. And, and the interesting thing about Warhol was that like, because what this book does, James, that you will love, and, and you kind of know this already, is it basically resexualizes him. Because for a long time, everybody was saying Warhol was asexual, you know, all those he sort of voyeur, He just liked to watch is what he always put out there. Right, but this isn't true. He had a string of boyfriends and was very sexual. And and um, we knew Jed, <laughs> I knew Jed, 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 what was it? Jed, Jed Johnson? Jed Johnson, Jed, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I knew Jed in the 80s a little bit. Um, and he was with Jed Johnson for 12 years is what I think it was, the last 12. Or then it, it, I think he broke up in the mid-80s, uh -huh. something like that. But um, there was also, I mean, it, 
he had a string and he was always he was very sexual and like i we knew that he was always grabbing people's dicks and pulling people's penises out and sucking dicks here and hither and yon at area i mean he was just he was a wild man I have an incredible book by Andy Warhol, actually, that I picked up in uh, in Italy a few years ago. That's in. It's just. It's all nude Polaroids that he's collected oh, over the years. Oh, hot! Uh, people who are coming <laughs> in and out of the factory. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was he was a little pervy like that. He um he was always you know just me too. Pull it out. Let's take a picture of it. <laughs> oh, apparently, James. Oh, he was. Is oh he was. He had a, oh, he had, yes, he had a big dick. Apparently. Nice. Uh, and reports vary about how good he was at sex. Some say he was just awful in bed, and others say he was a, a, a fiend. Um, so well, you know what, Fenton, we all have our off days. <laughs> well, I, from what I've heard is that he, um, there was a lot of crying afterwards. That he would, that, that, like, you'd have sex with him, and then he would sob for like three hours in bed, which is something that I do. <laughs> 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 yeah, he did always that thing though of like get your get your cock out, let me draw it. That was his shtick, even even like when he first came to New York. That was that was his icebreaker. And he yeah, just, and you know that would not fly in today's world. Like you could not do do any of the shit that he pulled in 2020. So it's a good thing that he did not live to see the Me Too movement. One of the things that was interesting was that he was um really into amateur dramatics. And um, he joined this thespian society, and they said that he was hopeless at reading lines. He was an awful actor. He could he could never project his voice. But in a way, it makes you realize that it's something. Well, I guess the whole book is saying there was something so performative about Andy Warhol, and that he actually found the role he was born to play. You know, because at first he was cute and he was cuddly and he was innocent and he would skip, and it's just very different. And then he became sort of because I remember asking my mother one time when I was like 12 or 13 who Andy Warhol was. And she said, oh, he's just he's a very creepy. He's a very creepy man. He's just a very creepy man. And I don't think you need to know about him. And she was very like upset that I started. She like she was very worried that I was asking questions about Warhol at age 12. My, my parents, too. My dad was just like, you don't want to know about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was does it does it get in in the biography? Does it get into how and why Warhol was so desexualized and asexualized over the years? I, I it, it hasn't yet, but I think the art the, the, the shocking truth is the art world is very homophobic, mm -hmm. and I think the idea the only that they are always covering up the gayness of artists because surprise an awful lot of artists are gay. Mm -hmm. And so the counter to that, even though so many people in the art world are gay, is actually for it to be a very homophobic closeted place and the idea so basically the only, way for him to artist, become, the only way for him to become famous was to say oh i'm not really gay i'm asexual i don't really do anything that and that that made him sort of palatable to the straights in the 50s uh, but guess. before all that james he was completely out he was he was very unabashedly sissy and swishy and a lot of other artists wouldn't allow him to be friend jasper johns and um it was Jasper John's friends with anyway, they, they wouldn't allow him to be friends with Andy because he was just too gay. Right, right. All right, we have to take a quick break. Have you got a question for us, Blake? I do. Both of my questions are about disgraced musicians this week. <laughs> Why not? I love it. So from the late 70s to the early 90s, he spent a combined three and a half years on the British charts. But you can catch him in jail now. And today is his birthday. Who is it? Well, I think I know the answer to this one. This is nice for, for a change. Okay, you're listening to the WOW Report, and we'll be right back with the answer after the break. You're listening to World of Wonders WOW Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the WOW Report. I'm Fenton here with James and James. <laughs> Blake Jacobs, Tom Campbell is on secret assignment, so we have a very super duper special guest. Welcome back, Jeffrey Boyer Chapman. Hi, thanks for Hi. having me. I'm so excited at the beginning, I forgot to introduce ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one really cares about that. So, Blake, uh, what was the question? Okay, um, from the late 70s to the early 90s, he spent a combined three and a half years on the British charts, but you can catch him in jail now. And today is his birthday, May 8th. Who is it? Is it Joe Exotic? <laughs> I'm going to say 
Gary Glitter? Gary Glitter. Yeah. There you Gary go. Glitter. And what was his big scandal? What what happened to him? Pedophile pop star. He what? Mm, pedophile. Oh pedophile. right. And they found they found uh, images on his computer or something of of been banned from like so many countries, like can't enter. And what was his big song? Rock and roll. Good to be back. Do you maybe, maybe when we oh, we do we don't want to play the song when we go out. We don't want to give him any any yeah. I don't know. But, but I think Jeffrey, I think you would know the song if you heard it. It's a very they they used to play it at like stadiums all the it's time. Right? Hey, hey. Oh, of course, of course, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Well, happy birthday, Gary Glitter. Right. <laughs> <Wrong now. laughs> okay, so we're counting down the top ten things that made us go, wow, we've reached number seven. What have you got? Number seven. Have you guys heard about Tom Cruise's new movie in space? I, I have. I've heard about this. Go ahead. Well, Tom Cruise and NASA have confirmed, they confirmed on Tuesday that they're working together to make a movie at the International Space Station. Like, what do, what do you... Look, look collect, collective... <laughs> it's like... Just collective eye roll. Yeah, because it, it, it's with Tom Cruise, it's like... You really are you? He's almost you know sixty years old. Do you really still have to prove that you're this action hero? This eight, you know, like start just just give it up, dude. Like you don't have to be doing stunts in your own stunts in space. Well, you and know? NASA NASA administrator Jim Brendenstein tweeted on Tuesday. The reason is because they need we we need popular media to inspire a new generation of engineers and scientists to make NASA's and NASA's ambitious plans the reality. But why would they pick Tom Cruise? Like, I feel like he jumped for Stark when he jumped on the couch. Like uh, Oprah. Over. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of who is who's who's a hot young star who would who I would watch in a movie in space. I mean, like, you know, Ryan Gosling or I mean but even Zach. Ryan's a little too old now. Zach so that uh, porn movie they made in space. They made a porn in space? Well, it wasn't technically space, but it was zero gravity conditions. So they were like oh, wow. floating around while fucking. Oh, that yeah, I don't remember that. That sounds fun. What was it called? I, I, who knows what it was called? It's called astronauts or something. <laughs> <laughs> there have been a few films filmed at the International Space Station. Um, an O2, an IMAX documentary that was actually narrated by Tom Cruise. Oh, okay. Right remember, and, remember um, when Lance Bass was trying to get a seat on the on the space shuttle, and he yes. was yeah. the first queen in space. He was this close. <laughs> that this close. close, yes. And so, so, Elon Musk is working with them to you as to use SpaceX to try to get them there. Well, apparently, well, Elon Musk is self imploding right now. I don't know. I yeah, I don't know if you've been following what's going on with Elon. Well, he lost his damn mind. Well, yeah, James, 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 can you pronounce the name of his child for me? <laughs> well, we're going to get to that. That is my number three <laughs> thing. We're going to talk about that child because what the fuck is going on with Elon Musk? So, Blake, do we know the, the storyline of this? Uh, of, yeah, supposed? has anything been written or did, is, is it just is it just the pitch is Tom Cruise in space and that's where they're going to raise their money off of? Basically, that's the pitch. The, the article I saw from... Um, the article I saw from Business Insider says that there's no no plans for it yet. It's just like at the very infancy. And I bet that it's kind of it's been like delayed because of this coronavirus. Like I mean, at this point, I really have no interest in even watching a Tom Cruise movie on Earth. So. No, no. And you know, it's a shame because a couple of his movies in the last 10 years have been really good. Um, I don't know if you remember the one with um Emily Blunt. Remember, it was like yeah, sort of a time yeah. loop one. Yeah, that was a really, it was a really well made movie. It was really good, but the fact nobody watched it because you're so sick of Tom Cruise that like the idea of of seeing a Tom Cruise and there was that one with Cameron Diaz too. Remember, Edge of Tomorrow was the one with Emily. Edge of Tomorrow, yeah, and it was a really well made Vanilla, movie. Are you? Do you mean Vanilla Sky with Cameron Diaz? No, 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 no. It was one where um, he, she was in a plane crash. 
I don't know. I don't know. But my, my point is, is that, that there's a bunch of movies with Tom Cruise that he ruins because people don't want to see Tom Cruise movies. He's I just. Know. I think, I'm I think, glad I'm not Tom Cruise or Anna Wintour this week. Uh, 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 I think that we should pull the page and start a Kickstarter fund to have uh, Katie Holmes star in a movie yes. at the International Space Station. Yeah, well, Suri, let's make Suri a star. Let's yeah. make Suri the next big star. I would, I would go see a Suri Cruise movie. <laughs> Me too. Uh, Terry Crews in space is what I would see. <laughs> what are the odds this Tom Cruise movie never gets made? I mean, come on. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Every now and then they talk about, we're doing this in space. We're doing that in space. Nothing ever happens. So mm -hmm. uh, let's move on to number six. What's number six? Number six. Number six. I've um, started watching Penny Dreadful's um, City of Angels, I think. Do you guys know about this? I've it's heard this, of it's it. It's the spinoff to Penny Dreadful. Yeah, yes. I don't, Jeffrey, did you watch the original Penny Dreadful? I've seen an episode here and there, yes. You know, it was a really interesting show, and I tried to get you to watch it, Fenton, when it came on. It was a show, it was a British show, and it um, was basically, you know, the Penny Dreadfuls in, in England back in the Victorian era were... Um, serialized novels, like horror novels that you got for a penny. They were they were dreadful. They were scary. They were little, little, you got them on the street. They were little horror stories that you paid a penny for. And it was like so what everyone watched. So the, the, the idea behind the show was that all the characters from the Penny Dreadfuls, um, it was Dorian Gray, uh, the Wolfman, Dr. Frankenstein, and they all got together and they were all real people and they were all fighting crime, basically, in Victorian England. And it had a really fantastic cast. It was Timothy Dalton, um, Josh Hartnett, Jonathan Rhys Myers, Ava Green was the big breakout star. She was fantastic. She's, she was my reason for watching it. For yeah, me. she's amazing. And yeah. the show was really well done. It was three seasons and they fought count dracula it was it was really fun well now it's set in they're back and it's 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 set in 1930s hollywood and it um is about basically there's a lot of uh, there's race wars that are happening there's the there are nazis that are trying to infiltrate america there's all this meth mexican mythology there's a lot of um mexican goddesses and gods that are sort of like pulling the strings of of what's happening in the 1930s Hollywood world. Um, there's a lot of Amy Semple Temple Amy Semple McPherson, the rise of radio televangelism, um, mm. great radio evangelist, um, mm. and a lot of Hollywood celebrities. But it's basically like the Mexican gods are starting a race war and there was i don't know if you remember in the 1930s in hollywood when they were building the highway through i think it was the 101 or something and it went through a mexican mexican-american village and this is something that really happened and the the villagers were standing up to the police and there was a giant clash of um, like a, a, a lot of mob wars and everything is the, is the police would beat the, the, the Mexican Americans. And so all of that is being sort of puppeteered by <laughs> the Mexican gods. It's fascinating and it's good. But the funny thing is, is that it's British and it's a lot of British stars. So you have, British stars trying to act with American accents and trying to act with Mexican American <laughs> accents. And um, Nathan Lane is in it. And Nathan Lane is playing a straight cop, a burly old ex detective. And he's, uh, he's uh, like really straight, like he's not camping it up at all. He's it's like, I've never seen Nathan Lane try and be straight before. And it's fascinating to watch that. Natalie Dormer is the 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 demon chaos demon and every female role she plays she she's oh, sort of like anytime there's a female character it's natalie in another wig and and makeup like trying to like sort of start you know start people fighting and start you know this and that and she's always sort of like in the background like you'll just see natalie in another wig and she's like the secretary and she comes in and says something that pisses someone off and then people start fighting everywhere she goes she just like starts chaos around her it's pretty it's it's fascinating and if you get a chance to watch it's uh city of angels penny dreadful and it's just it starts off with with the Mexican American war, the war with the police, and it's it's just it's a little niblet of Hollywood history that I don't think many people knew. Well, this is so fascinating to me. I love that uh, that uh, cable series are starting off 
their, their, you know, the premiere of their shows with these interesting historical moments that not many people know about. Did you all see Watchmen on HBO? Well, they, I, it's interesting you mentioned that because it, it's sort of the same thing exactly where you have the um the Oklahoma riot thing with the, tul- the, the Tulsa then, race massacre. Yeah, and and you it was something that we didn't really know about and the um, the the idea that that they take it the the, the race angle comes it's it's it, they they attack it in a different way that makes it interesting to young people. And because it's so, uh, you know, unfortunately, so topically relevant to the world yes, we're living exactly. in Yes, exactly. And I think there's some parallels with this. I think the the idea that um, uh, Trump and his war against the Mexican border, I think, was probably the impetus for this show to get made because it's showing that there has always been this this tr- this tension happening there with the 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 Mexican American community and the uh the uh, sort of the Aryan the there's the, the the Nazi people who are trying to to keep it you know divided. I'm going to check it out. Yeah. I, I think I, I and when you do I, I I want you to call me and I I, I want to sort of chew it over with you cuz it's fascinating. Absolutely. That's what, that's and so- the guy the oh, the 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 guy the um the, the Mexican American um, detective. He's the first detective. He's the first Mexican American detective in the police force, and he faces a lot of um, a lot of uh, prejudice and everything like this. But he's so hot. He is so <laughs> fucking. Hot. He's really a breakout star, and I hope we see a lot more of him. I can't remember what his name is, but he's really good looking. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> City of Angels on Showtime. So uh, my number five is um, number five. Do you guys ever watch BBC World News? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, it's got this. I, have you ever noticed the theme song? It's got these pips. Look, these pips. Oh yeah. But so those were pips of, of Greenwich Mean Time, and the the around the turn of the century, just twenty years ago, the BBC rewrote wrote a music, wrote a song around these pips, and it is so fucking good. And it's it's been remixed and remixed and remixed. It's sort of a rave staple. Wait, what, and, wait, 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 what's a pip? I don't even know what a pip is. I just played it. Beep, that, beep. Oh, a beep. Beep, beep, beep. Okay, beep. okay. At the top of the hour. I mean, th- those pips have existed since 1927. And 1999, this guy came in and wrote this amazing theme song. Just go go online and look up BBC News and you'll you'll hear the theme song. And it's so good. And what's what, the reason I'm even talking about this today is a friend of mine, Justin Davis, just emailed me. You know, like occasionally people email you mixes and songs and you're like, never going to listen to it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So I listened to it and I said, like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And it's Dua Lipa's hallucinate remixed to these pips and i can't tell you how brilliant it is it's very wavy it's very electro it's very craft work it's very um remember that rhythm is a dancer yes of course and oh yeah i hear that i feel that it's got this really great groove to it and it's become viral and this kid in his bedroom locked down during coronavirus basically just did this remix of dua lipa's hallucinate and it's like peanut butter and jelly. They are so good together. And this set me off down a little bit of a Google rabbit hole of, of researching the guy who wrote the song for the pips. Um, and, and the pips are sacred. You never speak over them. And they never use them as a sound effect. They only go at the top of the hour every hour. Six pips. Beep, beep. It's, I tell you, it's so good. It's a... You know, um, is this is something that you grew up listening to your whole life. That you, so you you knew this is this. It takes you back to your childhood. Is it is it sort of like a primal thing for you to hear these pips? I don't know what it is, James, because maybe it's that. But it's it's this sort of something about these pips is like it's the sort of uh, sound of all pop music. You know when Kraftwerk, funnily enough, you know when uh, Kraftwerk did uh, no Africa by Bada did Planet Rock. It just became the sound of all songs for years. You know, remember Planet Rock? Which was basically a Kraftwerk riff. Certain sounds, I think, just are sort of forever sounds. Right. Like, oh, I like Madonna's music. 
Right. Okay. Yes. So, yes. The, the single music. I don't mean all her music. I right. mean right. single music. Just yeah. something so incredibly instant about it. And oh, you know, there, there's something in it very. Um, uh, Dua Lipa is somebody who has that sort of um, instant stickability, like like everything she does lately. It seems admit, like this is an instant I'll classic, don't you feel? Her, her brand new album is so good. Every song on it is almost, like, it's flawless. So Yeah, I think Dua is someone that's going to be around for a while, and I think that her music is, is um, I, I, I really, she, she's she's amazing to me. Jeffrey, how do you, what do you think of her? I dig her. I, you know, unfortunately, I haven't listened to the new album, but Blake's recommendation there I'll you go. It. I'll buy it right now. <laughs> let's listen to Hallucinate, the BBC remix on the way out. Okay, let's do that. And do you have a question for us before we go? I do. It's about another disgraced musician. <laughs> <laughs> this week, Rosie O'Donnell was on uh, Watch What Happens Live, Andy Cohen's talk show. And she was talking about, he, he asked her if there was anyone on the do not invite again list. And she said, which disgrace, so the question is, which disgrace musician was put on Rosie O'Donnell's never return list after she claimed he burned himself with a crack pipe in the green room of her 90s hit show? Oh, wow. We are scorched earth today. We are just taking everyone down, aren't we? Uh, well, if it's a crack pipe, I guess you know the answer, James, right? <laughs> no, I don't. Okay. I, I do actually, believe it or not. <laughs> okay, we'll be back with the answer after the break. You listen to the Wild Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. And welcome back to the Wow Report. We're here with Jeffrey Bayer Chapman, um, James St. James, Blake, myself, Fenton. Uh, okay, Blake, so a disgraced musician. Yes, so the question is, which disgraced musician was put on Rosie O'Donnell's never return list after she claimed he burned himself with a crack pipe in the green room of her hit 90s talk show? I don't know this. Um, Jeffrey, you think you know? I think it's Leaf Garrett. Is that right? Yes. Oh. Yes. You remember that? Leaf was doing uh, Leaf was doing crack in her uh, green room? Well, he claims, he said, no, that's not even how it came close. I don't know if she's got Alzheimer's or <laughs> doesn't remember what happened, but it's on YouTube. You can watch the clip on YouTube. She said, I had a little burn on my face from using crack, which is so not true. First of all, I would never do anything like that. So, I don't know. I just love Rosie O'Donnell throwing shade at anybody. I mean, she was really ahead of the curve with, like, taking Donald Trump down back on the view yes, back in the day. God so bless her. She, and, she's onto something here. She and got on, crap for it. She also <laughs> said on Watch What Happened Live during the same segment that Bill Cosby made one of her female producers cry because he, like, grabbed his dick in front of her or something. <gasps> Mm -hmm. no, never invited back either and wow. she couldn't talk about it during the trial or when all of his stuff was going down in like 2015 because she was on the view but she was told not to talk about it then so mm. it come out it came out now mm. all right I forget, are, 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 <laughs> I forget where we've got to uh, <laughs> We're counting down the top 10 things that made us go wow, and we've reached number four. Number four. Okay, for number four, uh, we talked about, we talked to my little sister who went to New York a couple of weeks ago, you know, for uh, to work on the front lines. And I thought we would check in with her and see how she is. Becca, are you there? Hi. Hi. Just very quickly, just applause to you. Congratulations, yeah, I'm not congratulations, but it's um, uh, we're all just incredibly just in awe of, of what you've been doing. So tell us a little bit about what you've been experiencing. Um, well, we're definitely still seeing COVID, um, but they said it's nothing like it was two weeks before I got here. I mean, we still see it every day and it's crazy to watch like their progression. And I mean, and so sad. Um, but we definitely have multiples. My friend that's with me um, actually said that her hospital was at like 90% COVID. So and now she, has a friend, 
she has a friend with her that's also there and that's working at a different hospital. Mm, okay. Oh, wow. um, can you say which hospital you're at? So they're at 50% now, which is phenomenal because they Becca, were at like 90%. Becca, what hospital are you at? I'm at New York Presbyterian Allen campus. Wow. Okay. And, um, uh, how long are your shifts? And um, t tell me, like, a little bit about your daily, day to day work. What do you, what are you doing? Um, I'm ER. I'm emergency. So I get there at six forty-five. I actually get there at six thirty, but I clock in at six forty-five. Get my assignment and take over patients. It can be anywhere from just one patient to seven. Um, mm -hmm. But we have a great team, and there's a lot of us here that are traveling, so we all work very well together and um yeah so we just how, go in and take care of people <laughs> it's so hard to you know just just going out and wearing a mask and finding that quite difficult to get used to I I think think I think it's so hard to do what you're doing while suited up and in gloves and in masks i mean it, 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 what what's that like do you have all the proper PPE right now? Yeah, I was going to say, have you experienced any shortages at your hospital or are you guys um, uh, equipped? We are fully equipped at my hospital, luckily. Um, like face shields, we're reusing those, but masks, we get, we have a stock of them, but we pretty much don't take them off either way. So I only go through one or two masks and gowns we have, we're stocked. Thankfully, I mean... I don't think that they were a couple of weeks ago. So now um, I remember is seeing in the news um, recently there was an EMT worker who had um, uh, committed suicide, and then there was a girl. I think that um, uh, one of the doctors at your at your hospital too, who was yeah. under who who had, who tragically took her life as well um, due to the stress and everything. I think of it. Um, did you, had you met the, the woman who did that? I didn't meet her, um, but I've heard so many great stories about her. Um, she would come in on her days off and just do tasks, like work for free, um, and do tasks, like help clean a patient up. And that's just unheard of for doctors. I mean, wow. I guess not unheard of, but you know, it's, it's very rare that a doctor helps you clean up a patient or, something like that and she was there day in and day out doing it so yes it's really sad um i um, i just i, I want to say that um uh, you know i it, it, god bless you for for doing the work that you do but i imagine there is a lot of stress and is there a place that you can is there a a, a counseling or something that you can go to for what 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 is it what what do you guys have at your disposal to to help relieve the, yes, the stress? so we actually have like to um, just NYP, New York Presbyterian has two that they are pushing right now um, for psychiatric help or just to talk to anybody. I mean, it, you don't even have to like be depressed, but just to be able to talk about like- Just blow Brady, off some steam, yes. I mean, your shift, anything, just to be able to talk, so. Yeah, they have two great resources, like tele telemed. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, when do you get to come home back? Um, pretty sure I'm coming home on the 17th. And so you like, are a new mother, and it must be very hard to, to, to have left your baby behind. Are you do you, are you getting FaceTime with with them? Oh yes, I FaceTime them about <laughs> three or four times a day. I miss her so much. Yeah, I imagine. I imagine that. It, how old is she now? She's one and a half. Or oh. <laughs> well, we're proud of you, Becca, and thanks Thank for you. um taking time and talking to us. Yeah. God bless you. Thank you so much, Becca. Thanks, Becca. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh my God! Oh, that was so sweet. Like. I can't believe she, I forgot she's a new mom. I mean, that's, you know, the nurses are the angels on this planet. You know, they really, they're, they're amazing people and they, they are so selfless and so giving. She has a one year old child and she's off on the front lines. That's just an amazing story. James, is it, how, old, like, how old is the baby? She's a almost a year and a half. Oh. Oh, we just, do we Fenton just. He froze up. 
Benton, it looks like he's having a stroke <laughs> midway through. <laughs> Not oh, funny. There, he is. there you are. There you go. That was so oh. lovely, Blake. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, that. I'm sure yeah. that. Yeah, we're proud of her. James, so, what have you got for number three? Speaking of babies. Number three. Speaking of babies, yeah, baby fever. It, um, it, a lot. We have a lot of shout outs to give today. Um, one of our favorite people on the planet, Chloe Sevigny, just gave birth to a child uh, with her boyfriend, Sinisa Makovic. Um, they had a baby boy named Vanya Sevigny Makovic. And to, Chloe is one of our favorite people here at WOW. We love her so much. We love her to death. We've known her forever. And it's really spectacular. She's. Uh, we saw a picture of her out the other day with the baby, and they just look so adorable. That's so chic, and I can't wait to see how she is as a mother. And I, can't, I know. I can't wait to see the little baby's outfits. <laughs> That's so uh, exciting. Anderson Cooper, uh, right? Anderson Cooper, you know, had just gave birth to a child. And no, he did. He did. Anderson gave birth to a baby boy, a bouncing baby boy, um, Wyatt Morgan Cooper. And um, Wyatt, of course, was his father's name, Wyatt Cooper. And Morgan is a family name. His mother was Gloria Morgan. But, um, his grandmother was Gloria Morgan. And is that of like the banking Morgans? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, uh, in Thelma, it was, it was, they were twins, Thelma and Gloria. And, wow. um, uh, so, th so th it's a family name, and he he's so cute with the baby. I don't know if you've seen on CNN, and he keeps he he shows him. He's like, "This is my little peanut," and he calls him peanut, and it's just so cute. Well, and I, I heard he's already sharing clothes with Andy's son. Oh, I heard that that he's getting all of Andy's kids hand me downs. Um, and I think that his ex boyfriend, um, the one who had Eastern Block. Yes, who who ran that club? I think he's co-parenting with Anderson. I think they're um, even though they aren't together officially, that he said that he wants them to be a part of his life. So that's really great. And then I also want to say that Elon Musk and Grimes just had a baby. I don't know if you've been following this one, and the baby's name is X A E A dash twelve, and apparently the X stands for an unknowable variable. The AE symbol is an elvish uh, um, uh, word that means artificial intelligence. It also means love in Japanese. And um, the A-12 is a weapon. It's a precursor to, oh no, it's an aircraft. It's a precursor to the SR-17. Um, oh, that is. Yeah, I don't know. And the A um, also means Archangel, which is one of Grimes' songs. So it's A X A E A twelve. Is what, do you, the, what do you think the nickname is, James? Yeah, A A A. <laughs> it makes me think of American Eagle. Yes, it's, totally. Yeah, I mean, I have a feeling that the the babies they'll probably call it like Bob or something. You know, like <laughs> I saw the funniest meme. It was like I finally found how to pronounce the you know their name. And it's this girl, and she just opens her mouth, and it's all these robot sounds. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> so, funny. so. But I, I, the, I guess the takeaway is is that everyone's having babies, and it's 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 a wonderful thing in the you know in the quarantine that their their life is managing to go on normally. Oh, Jane, people. but but that baby's gonna have to have years of therapy for being mm -hmm. named after all that. Weird stuff. I mean, I thought Apple it was bad enough for Apple with Gwyneth Paltrow's child, right? That was that was only the beginning. That was yeah, only very Peruvian and yes, all all the the weird names. But I imagine all every celebrity child is is needs a lot of therapy eventually. <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we? <laughs> okay, moving on. I'm just going to talk very quickly at number two. Number two. I was going to talk about Michael Moore's new documentary. Uh, Planet of the Humans, which oh, is on YouTube, yeah. but your homework assignment, James, is to watch it for next week. It's a it's a documentary about global warming. It's really interesting. Um, but instead, I watched this morning. I watched Scandalous, the untold story of the National Enquirer. Which oh, really that's cool. fun! Yeah, great documentary on CNN. Uh, I think you can also get it on Amazon Prime. And it's it's just fascinating how. The National Enquirer has obviously shaped politics. I mean, not least 
I, I think one of the most important tipping points was when they got rid of Gary Hart as the Democratic nominee, you know, with that whole... Yeah, with the um, Donna Rice scandal right. in the 80s, yeah. Because that led to Bush, which led to Bush. You know, it's like you can see definitely... They are kingmakers. They, they they have the ear of the hoi of, of the of the hoi polloi, and right. so they managed to use that to to sort of seed um, people's opinions. That's but it's right. so crazy that the publication that talks about Bat Boy. Yeah, well, well, that's just it. That that's that's the insidious thing about it is they 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 are so lowbrow that they managed to dumb down the idea of politics so that they will, they will have bat boy and scandals and this and that. And then they'll sort of slide in. Trump is great. And well, then all, all of those really, people will love it. Yeah. Really interesting things. One is that Mashon originally when, first of all, the guy who, who, who really made it what it was, bought it and the money, he got the money to buy it from his godfather and his godfather just so happened to be the godfather. The mob godfather. Mm. And so there's been mafia money in the National Enquirer really since the beginning, number one. Number two, it, he started doing gore and car crash victims and horrible gore stuff. And it was only when he got distribution in supermarkets, because everyone was moving to the suburb in the 70s, he just cut out all the gore and pivoted to sort of entertainment and celebrity. And three, they weren't even interested in politics until politics itself became an like event. a reality show yeah like celebrity yeah. yeah yeah it was through uh ronan farrow's podcast catch and kill where he does an entire expose on the national Enquirer, showing how they you know are the kings of catching scandalous stories of the a-list celebs donald trump being you know enemy number one uh and killing it so they get they acquire all of the rights to these scandalous tales that have actually occurred and then they and imagine what the, what they have in their vault. Imagine the stories that they're sitting on. Well, they had a huge shredding party when Trump was elected. They, they destroyed. They got it all out and destroyed it, which is too bad. But the, you the, know, the, one thing Trump that was so protected was because a he had connections to the mob himself, but also because Trump was a great source for them. He was always calling them up and giving them leads, so he was sort of protected. I mean, it's just such a it's a Fascinating and, story, and, and apparently calling and disguising his voice and, and yeah, saying he was John Barron, yeah, right, posing as a publicist and then giving little tidbits. You know, I've them. heard that um, that my uh, according to my Twitter sources, <laughs> that what actually Kofefi, remember when Trump just tweeted the word Kofefi, that that was code yeah. for confetti, which means shred everything and make it into confetti. He it was right when Mueller was appointed, and he. Just put the word Kofefi out there, and that was code for everybody to shred everything and make it into confetti. That's terrifying. That's terrifying and fascinating. <laughs> Let's take a break. Um, we'll be right back with the number one thing that makes us go wow. I wonder if you can guess what or who it is. We'll be right back after the break. You're listening to The Wow Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. I'm Fenton here with James St. James and Blake. And we've reached the number one reveal. Number one. That's right. He's been here the whole time. <laughs> Jeffrey Boyer Chapman, you are the number one thing that makes us go wow. Not just this week, but every week. You make us go wow. Every <laughs> time I see you, I just say wow. I am legitimately gooped right now. I didn't know. <laughs> Oh, yeah. But you have season two of your podcast, Conversations with Others. Yes. Oh, my Tell gosh. Yes. It. Tell us. It's so exciting. So we, uh, uh, I just uh, started uh, recording from home during all of this COVID uh, crisis. And um, we have two episodes out so far. Last week's episode was my co-Judgy Judy of the North, Brooklyn Heights. Uh it was, from Canada's Drag Race. That's from Canada, from Canada's Drag Race, and the week before that was uh, Tatiana Maslany. This week coming up, we have uh, the star of the HBO uh, stand-up special "My Favorite Shapes," uh, Julio Torres. Oh! <gasps> Julio oh, Torres, we love him so much. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I just had. No Fenton and I are obsessed. You've met Julian. Do you know Julian? Do you, so, so Fenton, were you with us at the Emmys, the Creative Arts Emmys, with Rue this past September? 
Yes, I was. Oh, no, right. the three divides. I was only at the big, the, the other ones. Okay, I so, only, so I was only the main one. <laughs> the big meal deal. So we actually talk about this in this episode of the podcast. We talked about this in this episode of the podcast, how we were all, uh, I was there as Ruse Day to the Creative Arts Emmys, and we were all gathered on kind of side stage for about half an hour before the show started, uh, as celebrities started to like, you know, uh, just kind of corral into the green room. Marie Kondo, Lisa Kudrow, Jeff Goldblum, Kim Kardashian. Yeah, I don't and, so, and, so, and so Brooklyn and uh, Nina West and I went into the green room where I met Julio Torres for the first time, fell into a deep conversation, started talking for so long that we missed the beginning of the show, including Rue snatching his trophy for best reality host. So wait, can you actually count Julio as a friend? I mean... I, I think he's one of those people that um, I, I think as the decade goes on, we're going to hear more and more from him, and he's going to become one of the most important celebrities and <laughs> in, in, in game changers of I, our I, generation. He's like I, I, you know, I, 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 I totally agree. And from the first moment that I saw him uh, on his special, My Favorite Shapes, he was somebody who I immediately wanted to become friends with because I just wanted to know the inner workings of this, this, this bizarre, mind. brilliant genius. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's like, um, I have to ask you a question, which is, um, what did he smell like? What? What, what did he does he smell, smell like? like? <laughs> night, night blooming jasmine. <laughs> your first episode of your podcast, I couldn't help notice, was Jesse Smollett. Yes, that's right. Oh, um, any chance of a redo? I mean, do you think it would be great to talk to him again, wouldn't it? You know, it's interesting. Yes, I mean, I would love to talk to him again. Jesse was somebody who was a good friend of mine years ago. He was one of my first friends when I moved to New York, and we did a movie together. Uh, and he was the first guest on the first season of my podcast. Um, this was before all of the the scandal went down. He and I haven't haven't talked about it to be and to be totally honest with you. Um, I would I would love to have that conversation, but I feel like it's uh, it's up to him to decide when and where I, he's going yeah, to I, I tell think that Yeah, I think there's a book in him. I think he he has a whole, uh, a lot to talk about in, in someday. Definitely, yeah, I thought it was I so- I definitely was... feel there's also a story there that we haven't heard. That like, we still, whatever it was happened, we still don't know what it was. Oh, yeah. I, I agree, I agree entirely. I feel like there's definitely a story to be told there. Yeah. yeah. So can you tell us who some of your upcoming guests are? Ooh, well, Julio Torres for next week, and then who else is who am I going to have on the pod this uh, this season? Uh, Karamo Brown, Constant uh, Zimmer. Uh huh. Um, uh, ooh, ooh. I, it, the 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 list goes on and on. I have some truly phenomenal guests coming on. That's this really season. fun. I can't wait. And, I, I'm not much of a podcast person, but I will. I will definitely check in yours. Do you know what's funny? Actually, now that you're the one asking. Skinny James, uh, thinking about it, on my list of 12 people that I wanted for the for the next couple of weeks coming up, your name is on it. I would love to sit and have a conversation with you, James St. James. Well, I, I'm definitely there. I will definitely do it. No, no, no doubt about it. Excellent. You, you should just carry on right now. We'll leave and you just... <laughs> <laughs> so, so tune in. Thanks, thanks for the shout out, Fenton. JBC oh, presents conversations with others. Yeah, well, I'm very excited. I didn't mention that you are one of the judges, one of the throuple. Uh, of yes. judges on Canada's Drag Race, which will yes. be, uh, hasn't yet been announced, but it's coming soon and you'll be able to see it in Canada, of course, on Crave, but you'll also be able to see it on Wow Presents Plus. And Thank it's, it's Now, wait, this is something that you, you managed to film before everyone went into lockdown. You have the whole season done. Yes, mm -hmm. thankfully, thankfully, oh, okay. and I think it's going to be—it's going to be such a, a great timing and a perfect treat for the world to be able to dive into, you know, kind of find an escape from, uh, you know, the current goings on in the world around us and see the extraordinary talent that these Canadian queens came to offer. It's—it was I, my mind was blown every day. I can't give much away, but you will be gagged and gooped. It's so I, interesting I'm to me. Uh, I, it's, it's so interesting me to, to me to see the um you know in Thailand in uh, um in in Chile in Canada in the UK that everybody has their own they they all bring their own different thing to it and to see the 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 
the way the Canadian queens differ and are the same, you know, to, to all the other queens. It's just fascinating to me to the, the way that it's taken off the way that it has. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And I am just a quintessential super fan. I am somebody who was completely uh, obsessed with the show and everything that it represents. And it is beyond a dream come true to be in this position. It was a dream come true to sit on the panel of RuPaul's Drag Race as a guest judge and then to have this opportunity. It was mind blowing. Fenton, did you, uh, when all of this, uh, was born when you birthed this into the world. Did you ever see it uh, evolving into what this what it's become? Well, you know, I, I you know we must thank our fearless leader Rue. I mean, I, I don't think so in the sense that you always hope any show you make is going to do well. But I think to see what become the the phenomena it's become is it's actually very minutes. humbling. And I remember that first season. Um, the moment it started going viral, and I remember Gawker was doing a, a weekly recap, and it was like in the very beginning of recap culture, and um, uh, New York Magazine started, is, you started seeing everybody doing recaps of it, and you start, and you realized, oh, this is going someplace. This is this is catching on. It's it was like it was like wildfire. You just saw the way everybody was, and I knew from that first season that it was it was destined to to real and it's it was a slow burn by god but it 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 now it is a cultural phenomenon that unlike anything we've ever seen in our lifetime 10 oh years on here we are and i and i think it's testament you know look i think it's testament to the queens because their talent their charisma their uniqueness and their, their talent you know they really do bring it and they really do have it it is true artistry and I, as james says it's in every culture every country is different and i sometimes think canada gets knocked from the, you know gets teased for being like not as american as america or mm -hmm. not having as strong an identity and i think people will be amazed when they see canada's drag race that ain't the case you know yeah every bit as strong as stronger than than any cast of any show I, I completely agree, and uh, I didn't have reference for Canadian queens out aside from Brooklyn Heights, and that was a that was a some big shoes to fill, honey. And these queens truly step up; they're extraordinary. They really are. Well, Jeffrey, thank you for joining us. It's always a delight, and I hope I hope you'll come back a third time. Anytime, uh, Benton. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, James. Thank you, Blake. Don't go out. Right? Yeah. Don't go out. Stay in, kids. <laughs> Stay home and do something that makes Stay home. the world B go binge, out. binge some WoW Presents Plus. Listen to my podcast. There you to go. Keep you entertained. We have a new episode of Transformations up this week, too, with the wonderful Juno Birch, uh, Manchester Queen. I don't know if you know Je Je Jeffrey. Do you know Juno Birch? I do. Yes. Yeah. It's extraordinary. So ch check that out. That's on WoW Presents Plus, too. And thank you, Blake. And especially thank you, your sister, Becky. Yeah, Becca. She's amazing. Becca is amazing. Oh, all right. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>